So chapter two is on research in the social sciences, especially sociology. The question is as before, are where did sociology come from or so questions come from? What is the best method to research sociological questions? How is data collected? And how do sociologists make sense of their findings? So remember these four questions, some all maybe will be on the um, second quiz or second assignment. These places that we get information from include epistemology, which is the, the uh, understanding of where we get knowledge from, from Typically, it's from tradition in the past, what we've already studied. It's from our values and morals. So they drive, often drive, why we study what we study. Um, ethics is another, which is a little different than morality. It has to do with what's appropriate and inappropriate behavior. We'll talk more about this later. Uh, it generally comes from theoretical traditions, which we'll talk about. And it also um, must follow the ASA's Code of Ethics. So I'll put the American Psychological Association Code of Ethics up on um, the, the page, the Blackboard page. But essentially, uh, it establishes the principles and ethical standards that underlie a sociologist's professional responsibility and conduct, including things like being competent, maintaining professional and scientific standards, uh, avoiding conflicts of interest, that is, um, putting your needs ahead of the uh, s uh, subject's needs, confidentiality, which is a re really big one, uh, informed consent, which I'll, um, which means telling subjects the risk involved. I'll put a couple of videos up on the uh, Blackboard page for you to watch. Uh, the whole process of research planning and getting information which where it needs to be and it even includes, as you'll notice when you look through the uh, APA standard, guide on plagiarism. That is using someone's work as your own. <clears throat> the best method for doing sociological research is really sort of a no-brainer. Well, it kind of depends on the question. Um, there are different there are different methods to use. Um, and true experiment uses both dependent and independent variables. So if you manipulate an independent variable, um, you can measure outcomes in the dependent variable. Very often though, doing uh, true experiments in sociology is difficult because of the scale of things. Uh, manipulating and controlling for extraneous or confounding variables is tough in social situations. <clears throat> there are other methods that are equally as acceptable, except they just don't show cause and effect relationships. They include surveys. Some interesting ones include the political ones that come out this time of year, the uh, Kin, um, Alfred Kinsey sex survey. The uh, census that's going on right now is a survey. It basically is taking the pulse at any point in time of whatever question you're asking or whatever, whatever topic you're researching. There are interviews, which can be short or long. Um, issues involved with interviews, though, is that what you find in one interview may not apply to other situations. So the researchers call that limitations in external validity. Uh, ethnographic research, this is typically seen in or in anthropology than sociology, um, but where an anthropologist would live within the uh, group of people that they're studying. So if you're studying hobos and right, the rails, you might live with hobos to see what it's like. Or if you were homeless, you might live in a homeless shelter for a while. <clears throat> you tend to lose objectivity though. That's one of the issues that comes up with ethnographic research. True experiments that I just mentioned are the gold standard, if you will, of doing psychological research and social, soci sociological research, where you control variables, 
um, and measure outcomes. Historical research is important too in sociology because um, historically speaking, if you're studying something that happened in the past, you really can't have any control of what's going on now. So let's say you were studying divorce rates for the last century. You can't really interview people that are no longer with us. So that's an important tool in the sociologist research bag. <coughs> Surveys, of course, are used all the time because they're inexpensive and they give lots of information. Uh, In-depth interviews, of course, are more labor-intensive and have limitations in their external validity. And ethnographic research, of course, as I just mentioned, uh, looks at how people interact with each other and um, has limitations in external validity. Research and surveys can be done on in person or on the telephone. Uh, typically, uh, telephone surveys um, have some re problems with rejection. You can find <coughs> people not wanting to take the phone call, or for that matter, um, uh, it can be done online as well. Um, so survey researchers can get lots of information very quickly. You might notice that um, online surveys are far easier to take and, of course, um, are completely confidential, typically. Question three is, how is data collected? Well, the short answer to that is using the scientific method. Uh, this tradition goes back several hundred years uh, in which data is collected uh, in accordance to a plan and um, to minimize uh, problems with data collection, to use the scientific method, which includes formulating a hypothesis and making predictions about what is going to happen, operationalizing and predicting what variables you'll use. So it's one thing if you're watching a rat press a bar, you can operationalize learning. But some social variables like love and trust and integrity and um, are very difficult to operationalize. Collecting data using um, the techniques of uh, social researchers. Um, often data collection, if it's done online, can be very quick and intensive. Um, checking for variable relationships, that is using correlation coefficients, which don't give you any idea about causality, but can show you if there's trends in data and coming up with conclusions about what the results mean. Sampling is always a big issue, especially in sociological research. How big of a sample do you need? <clears throat> Are those samples reliable and valid? Um, does it have access to the entire population? So consider the fact that uh, if you're doing a survey online, does that prohibit some people who may not have computers? Uh, even the time commitment. So I mentioned Kinsey's report um, on sex survey back in the 1940s. His survey um, was extremely labor intensive. Some interview sessions would take up to um, eight or 10 hours to do. Uh, most of the time in doing research, you let the person know ahead of time what type of time commitment is expected. Another example of survey, a more contemporary one, is the Gallup poll. And it's used to measure attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors about just about everything, from politics and social issues to refrigerators and what you watch on television if you watch television. Um, and because of it, and it's wide use for decades, uh, we've been able to track significant changes in public opinion over a long period of time. Think about the differences between, for example, uh, interracial marriage between blacks and whites. Uh, if you go back to the 1950s, many people were disapproving of it. If you go to more contemporary days, people um, have a far different opinion. And we were only able to track this because of the advantage of uh, long time commitments. 
sometimes, as I mentioned, comparing the past to the present requires digging through stacks of data. So you examine a social phenomenon over a long period of time, and for that matter, in different places across time and place. Um, growing up as a child uh, uh, in a Catholic home, we I knew no one who was divorced. Um, but nowadays, children can't say that. Um, so you can track things over time and place. Um, the takeaway, in some ways, for correlation coefficients is that while things might seem to be related, positive, negative, or um, correlations, correlational values, uh, one doesn't cause the other. It can make inferences. It can give you some idea of what might be causing change, but you have to do true experiments to show that. Correlations are done e very easily, even though it's really not a type of research or of a mathematical manipulation <coughs> that um, looks at the relationships of two piles of data. Uh, back in the 1960s, when coronary heart disease was believed to be linked to a diet, <coughs> those were only correlation coefficients. In order to demonstrate a, a true cause and effect relationship, uh, the research had to be done with animals, uh, feeding them high fat diets, and lo and behold, they had coronary heart disease. <laughs> uh, that fact um, is a given nowadays. People, you'd be hard pressed to find any doctor that wouldn't uh, um, promote the idea that diet causes uh, arterial changes in, in not only in rats but in humans. Interview methods are interesting. Um, you can get information in a person's own words, which is nice. It gives people often more marginalized the chance to talk about their condition <clears throat> and allows for uh, us to understand, understand the subtle nuances of what we find. There are weaknesses, though, <coughs> um, which is what I find in one case apply to everyone. Um, and, uh, it's difficult at times to turn research questions into focused interviews. Um, the, probably the biggest downfall, though, is that when you do long interviews, you get tremendous amounts of data, um, sometimes 30, 40 hours worth of interviews. Uh, the good news, though, is that there are software nowadays that analyzes data for um, content. So you can pick any number of topics um, we talk about this one in the textbook about unwed mothers, but we'll just skip it. Ethnographic methods are um, uh, challenging, to say the least. Their strengths include you can use the continuum to determine context, so certain sorts of things happen in certain contexts, and unless you understand that from the contextual perspective, perspective, you don't really understand um, the phenomenon. <clears throat> One of the things, for example, when uh, my wife and I went to Uganda for a, uh, a, a mission trip a few years ago, we were told that um, patting a child on the head is a sexual reference. Uh, and, out of, and it's totally out of context in this culture. Patting a child on the head has m many different meanings. Uh, but only living in that community would you know that. One of the great things about this, though, is it produces a lot of rich and uh, subtle, nuanced accounts of uh, life in these small communities. <clears throat> a good example of, if you're interested in um, understanding the cultural use of like hallucinogens, a series by Carlos Castaneda back in the 1970s looked at um, drug use, uh, spiritual drug use in Mexican Indians in Mexico, uh, and it's a fascinating account that it covers about six or seven books on the use of psychotropics, uh, and it's worth reading. Um, so one, another strength, of course, is the rich detail that's given. Some of the challenges, of course, is trying to make sense out of all this. So if you read Carlos Castaneda's books, you walk away with kind of an interesting and almost perplexed perspective on drug use um, with really drawing no conclusions.
Um, so one of the main uh, strengths of ethnographic is, uh, is also a central weakness in producing thick descriptions of interesting aspects of social life. Ethnography can sometimes lack analytic focus and theoretical relevance. So the theory is really what drives the research. And when you're just poking around studying ethnographic topics, it can often be challenging to make sense of what that all means. Question five, of course, is how do they make sense of their findings? Well, they do that through um, using theory. They code data. Um, the data feeds into um, uh, different themes, and the themes um, reflect on what theoretical construct you're studying. So there's the issues of data analysis, data coding, how you display data and give it to your colleagues, and of course, um, how you keep track of the notes that you make. Um, nowadays, um, social researchers have very powerful um, tools. Uh, IBM makes a, a package called SPSS, which is used, used to be referred to the statistical package of the social sciences, but now it doesn't refer to that, but it's a very powerful tool that helps you analyze the social world. Um, uh, some of the same things can be done with Excel and other survey tools, but anyway, you make conclusions about the social world based on um, what theory you adhere to. So theoretical um, generalization, generalizability is important, and for that matter, just looking at what the data means. So the theory of lens of theory is critical. And we're